everyone and welcome uh, to the webinar uh, organized by the Energy Resources and Environment Program and the Initiative for Sustainable Energy Policy at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. My name is Johannes Urpelain and I'm your host um, today. We are today going to hear from uh, Chris Castro, uh, who is uh, the Director of uh, Sustainability and Resilience for the city of Orlando uh, in Florida. Uh, Chris is uh, uh, an amazing uh, entrepreneur who has um, done almost everything you can imagine in the field of sustainability, from starting nonprofits to a starting a climate bank to advising the mayor of Orlando to giving over 150 presentations on topics of sustainability and resilience uh, around the world. So I think today's webinar is going to be really interesting because we are going to touch both sides uh, of the issue. On the one hand, we'll be talking about sustainability, which is uh, how do we reduce our impact? How do we make uh, this planet lasts for all of us for many generations to come. But on the other hand, we also talk about resilience. So how do we deal with the fact that humans have already left uh, a lasting large impact uh, on the planet? So how do we live in a planet that's already changed uh, in many ways for the worse because of uh, what we do here? So it'll be really interesting to hear from, uh, from somebody who is uh, really uh, in the thick of things, uh, working on all these issues uh, in Florida. So as usual, uh, we are going to first ask uh, Chris to give his presentation. And uh, for the audience, if you have any questions or comments, please use the Q&A function. I will then uh, curate and moderate the discussion with Chris after uh, we have uh, heard his uh, presentation. With that, uh, Chris, uh, the floor is uh, all yours. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much for the invitation to join you with today's webinar. And for all of those who have joined us today virtually, again, my name is Chris Castro. It's quite an honor to be here with you. I serve as uh, Mayor Buddy Dyer's senior advisor on all things sustainability, climate, and resilience related, uh, and direct the Office of Sustainability and Resilience here in the city of Orlando. And a lot of people you know, probably have heard of our city and, and uh, hopefully you visited as well. But people often don't understand even half of what's going on in Orlando. Uh, we are certainly a world-class sports and entertainment destination uh, with, with theme parks and, and wonderful attractions. And most of the times people get to witness that. In fact, in 2019, Orlando witnessed 75 million visitors to our city in that calendar year. It's about 200,000 people per day that don't live or work here in our city, but come here to play and enjoy our, our wonderful uh, surrounding environments, natural lands, uh, and of course, the theme parks and the entertainment uh, that often their families get to come and, and see. Uh, so, you know, we are the most visited city in America with that stat. And in addition, um, have been one of the fastest growing cities in the country. We're still in the top five fastest growing cities, seeing about a thousand people move into the region per week. Uh, and, and so as you can imagine, with all of that growth and, and, and tourism, uh, that's wonderful for our local economy, but it does have often some unintended consequences. And, and part of our role in my office of sustainability is to think about ways in which Orlando can continue to sustain that type of growth without impacting public health and our quality of life, and of course, without degradating natural resources and the environment uh, as, as we move forward. So, um, you know, starting out, I wanted to share that Orlando's journey uh, for sustainability really was created back in 2007 when Mayor Dyer, uh, still at the time, had this vision of, of making, a, you know, Orlando as this world-class city, a showcase for the world as it relates to being more environmentally friendly, socially equitable and inclusive and economically vibrant, focused on the green economy and, and innovation. Uh, and over the course of, of that term, uh, we have built out a very comprehensive approach and strategy to urban sustainability, really looking at cross-sector policies and programs uh, that help protect natural resources, that help improve public health, uh, reduce carbon emissions, help create new jobs and economic investment opportunities, reduce operational expenses for the city, and, and, and be an educational arm as well for our residents in terms of how they can minimize their overall footprint living within the city. And, you know, it's been uh, quite fascinating to be able to, to lead this office with an incredible team uh, and, and really make, start making some needles move in the right direction. 
Um, the other important thing I wanted to mention is, is, uh, is the work that we have been doing to center and align the global sustainable development goals with our local priorities in Orlando. And I've outlined in those black boxes some of the core SDGs that we have direct alignments with in terms of the local priorities that our communities and stakeholders, you know, really demanded from the city. Uh, and it's fascinating in, in being part of a global network of peer cities working on the SDGs, how much more this is becoming a unifying framework for recovery post COVID-19. I mean, a lot of our cities are asking for green and equitable recoveries post COVID, an opportunity not to bounce back to where we were, but to bounce forward in a more resilient way. And um, I think it's critical that as we move forward in whatever institutions that we're in, we continue to center back to this Rosetta Stone for a better humanity that essentially is trying to end poverty, eliminate inequalities, and protect ourselves from the threats of uh, climate and environmental crisis that we're facing today. So I talked about our team, you know, when I joined City of Orlando seven years ago, I was, I was the only person working in this space. And today we have about a dozen staff in the Office of Sustainability and over 40 other staff in different departments and divisions that um, are part of the Greenworks Orlando team. Uh, and that's the beautiful thing about, you know, the way that we've structured this initiative in Orlando is that it's not just a siloed effort, you know, hidden somewhere in a department. We've actually established this Office of Sustainability in the executive department of the city. And we're charged with working across the entire institution from police and fire to planning and permitting, streets and stormwater, solid waste, economic development, you name it. Uh, and in addition, provide the same service uh, to our, our community, to the utility, to the transit authority, to our airport, universities, and our residents. So we're kind of this in-house sustainability consulting firm that really gets to roll up our sleeves every day, helps to, to, to identify challenges, operational challenges, that, let's say within the city, and work with them on optimization, ways to drive more efficiency, and of course, reducing the overall impacts. Now, our, our, trend, our, our journey has come a long way and you know, cities do a lot of planning. And, and so one of the things that I wanted to showcase here is the plethora of different types of plans that we have established and co-created, not just with city staff, but also with our residents and stakeholders. At the top left, you have this municipal operations sustainability plan, really looking internally at ways in which we can change our own fleet vehicles and reduce our own waste. At the top right, we have the community-wide sustainability action plan, really looking externally and setting broad goals for the entire community. Uh, we and, and most recently in, in December, 2020, we just published our future ready master plan and implementation roadmap at the bottom right there. And that, that plan really centers this concept of smart cities uh, and, and how we leverage data, technology and analytics to help um, accelerate our, our, our goals for sustainability. So they're not creating new goals, but they're really looking at, you know, how, how can we leverage um, the di digital world to accelerate uh, and achieve those goals. Being that uh, we wanted to talk about climate as well, obviously you can't manage what we don't measure. Right? And so doing a greenhouse gas emissions inventory is one of the ways that cities, universities, corporations are starting to get a handle on the amount of carbon they're contributing to the carbon budget. How much is Orlando emitting to this climate crisis? And so over the course of the last 10 years, we've been doing uh, an annual greenhouse gas emissions inventory, looking at all of the uh, uh, various activities across the cities, the various sectors, and, and how many emissions they contribute. So if you look at the pie chart on the right hand side, you see that there's two really important wedges that we've been paying attention to. The first wedge, uh, in fact, both of those wedges are kind of around the same concept, and that is building energy use, building energy use on site, as well as the electricity that they're consuming that's often produced off site. And, and when you combine the energy used by our built environment, it ends up equating to um, over 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, that Orlando is contributing. That's our homes, our hotels, our venues, our office buildings, you name it. In addition, the yellow wedge that you see there is really on-road transportation and, and mobility sources, things like our buses, our freight, transit, um, you know, rail, and, and of course, single occupancy vehicles. Uh, and then you have smaller wedges there around our waste and wastewater, around fugitive emissions and, and the like. And so this really has helped us uh, better understand where we should start targeting our, 
our resources, our technical assistance, our priorities. Uh, and it really bubbles into these four key buckets you see here. First, we have to reduce building energy use and we have to drive more energy efficiency. Secondly, we need to decarbonize the electric grid and start to move towards rapid advancements of renewable energy sources. Third, we have to enable um, alternative forms of transportation so that our residents can reduce the vehicle miles traveled throughout the city. And, and lastly, we need to electrify uh, our vehicles, decarbonize the energy system, uh, not just for electricity generation, but for transportation modes as well. So in, a, in the presentation uh, moving forward, I'm gonna dive into specific strategies that we've now implemented to demystify how cities are going about advancing a sustainable energy future and, and addressing the climate crisis. So knowing that buildings are the 70 you know, percent pound gorilla, so to speak, uh, we you know, think it's critical that we you know, start with buildings. And many cities around the country are also realizing that energy efficiency in buildings are one of the most cost-effective ways to address the climate crisis, and they create jobs, and they save money, and they, and so on and so forth. So leading by example, and this is a, a value that the city of Orlando really holds true to us, uh, we have set a stretch code for all city buildings uh, to achieve a lead silver minimum uh, for new construction. This doesn't just include your office and administrative buildings. We have held that standard for our performing arts center, our major multi-purpose arena, uh, obviously the fire station, the neighborhood centers. And, and so we feel that this is critical and it's important to realize that it's actually the most fiscally prudent and efficient way to build public building buildings in general. Only 25% of the cost uh, over the lifetime of, building, uh, of a building is spent on constructing that building. And 75% of the cost is often the operation and maintenance of that building over the useful life. So as a city who's building and owning these properties until they crumble one day or need to be repurposed, it is uh, the most economically uh, smart thing and fiscally prudent thing to do uh, to build these to a higher performing spec, to minimize the ongoing operations and maintenance of these buildings and therefore lower taxpayer expenses to run the city. Um, the other thing that we've been doing is actually retrofitting some of the outdated buildings that weren't built to that stretch code. And Orlando's gotten a lot of national recognition for our energy efficiency green bond that we took out in 2016. It was over $17.5 million that was specifically earmarked for energy efficiency retrofits in public buildings. This included our Amway Center, as you can see in this image, where we retrofitted all of the high intensity sports lighting to LED and saw a 10% reduction in energy use just from uh, lighting retrofits at, at that arena to uh, 55 additional buildings, City Hall and Amway, you know, the, the fire stations and neighborhood centers, all that got upgrades from LED lighting to HVAC improvements, and most specifically adding building automation and controls and sensors um, to help us in more in real time understand how the buildings are using energy and ways in which we can optimize them to be most efficient and save energy even more. Um, now, the question is often, uh, how do we start getting the rest of our community to think about energy efficiency and the potential that it has to help us save money and, and even make money if you're a building owner? Uh, and one of the policies that we have implemented is a, uh, we, we call it BWES, but it's a building benchmarking energy audits and transparency policy. In short, it requires the largest buildings in our city, above 50,000 square feet, to go through an annual uh, energy benchmark exercise using uh, the Energy Star Portfolio Manager tool. This is a free online tool provided by the US EPA, and it essentially gives your building a miles per gallon equivalent, a one to 100 score on how efficient your building uses energy and water and, and the carbon intensity of that building. And what's fascinating is we now have an open data map. This is the image of that found on our website where um, nearly a thousand buildings are annually submitting their, their in information, their data through Energy Star. And we're able to really analyze that information and get some insights as to where we should start developing incentives or re new rebates to target those buildings with the highest carbon intensity and the highest energy use intensity as well. 
Um, so, uh, and by the way, a BUS impact report will be coming out uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks. And so you can really do a deep dive in this energy policy and how uh, it has helped to create a market for energy efficiency in buildings. And of course, from an equity perspective, uh, we are you know, starting to really map our community to identify where residents are, you know, are facing burden and, and, and inequities. One of those is leveraging the GreenLink equity map, a brand new tool for cities out there uh, to understand the utility burden of our households. This map on the right hand side is a chloropleth map looking at which households have the greatest energy burden. That is, a, you know, uh, uh, paying for utilities above what the average monthly household income is. Uh, and so normally somebody in Orlando is spending about 4% of their monthly income on utilities. And what we've identified is that there are certain residents that are spending, you know, 10, 12, 15% of their monthly income on utilities. And they're often in rental properties. There's this split incentive with landlords and tenants and the landlord being reluctant to make improvements uh, because they're not paying the utility bill. So they're kind of reluctant to make those improvements until it's absolutely necessary. And as a result, these low in often low income households, communities of color are spending more per square foot than affluent communities. We need to address that. It, it is a huge issue, not just in Orlando, but across the country. And in fact, one of the programs we launched is, is called SELF, Solar and Energy Loan Fund. It's a nonprofit partner of ours uh, that specifically targets low-income households and provides low-interest loans uh, to residents in order to make some of these property improvements that helps them reduce that energy burden. Uh, over the course, since August of 2020, uh, we have seen about 21 households actually use the SELF program, about $261,000 in lending. And um, the beautiful thing about this is this also favors minority and women business enterprises, MWBE enterprises, uh, and the contractors to help you know, do the work in those businesses. So we're really, from an equity standpoint, trying to cover all bases of reducing burden for the households, also helping to drive more demand for MWBE businesses, and, uh, and, and really drive more of the investment here uh, locally. Lastly in buildings is around new construction. So we've thought about, okay, we have some retrofit uh, uh, you know, programs and, and tools. I haven't mentioned, but we also have PACE financing, property assessed clean energy, another fantastic financing tool. I can talk in more detail in the Q and A if you'd like. Uh, but what we didn't have uh, up until recently was an incentive program for new construction. And so we, after a year's worth of engagement with our CFO and CAO, as well as many developers, professional associations like ASHRAE, USGBC, ULI, as well as the development community, uh, we came together to understand where the gaps are, why we're not seeing more green building development in Orlando. And uh, one of the things that we took out of that was if the city provided a property tax rebate incentive that we would see significantly more green, healthy buildings being constructed, especially post COVID, right? LEED certified buildings are much healthier uh, for the occupants. And there are many other green building certifications out there, you're probably aware. Uh, we did a full analysis of this and looking at the US GSA, the, the General Services Administration, they have a great high performance green building certification analysis so if you're interested in learning the difference between LEED and Living Building and Green Globes, go to that site, look it up, it's, it's a great resource. Uh, we use that and ultimately what we provide now is a program where a new developer can, uh, can get up to 50% of the first year's property taxes rebated back uh, if they hit LEED Silver, 75% rebated back if they hit LEED Gold, and 100% if they hit LEED Platinum or above. And as you can imagine, this is intended to offset the marginal cost increase on developers to build these higher performing buildings, right? To build to the Florida Building Code, which I call the worst building to build by law, because it is, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a certain price point to get it to higher performing, more efficient, healthier, less impact on the environment. We see between a five and sometimes 10% marginal increase in cost. So to do, but obviously the long-term benefits over the lifetime, like we talked about earlier for city buildings. The challenge is developers often don't own and operate those buildings they build. Most developers are in the game to build it and transfer it over to an owner that will operate over the long-term. And, and that creates a split incentive, right? If the developer is gonna spend more 
uh, to build this building, but not be able to, you know, transition it to the property owner for a higher value or maybe a value equivalent, then why would the developer do it? And, and that's the, the split incentive we're trying to address. So the first year's property taxes can go back to the developer who was in essentially the driver's seat to control how the building was going to be built. And then therefore they can then transfer it over to a new owner uh, in the, in the future. So that's a little bit high level on, on what we've been doing to reduce demand on the building side. And I think it's critical that as we move towards sustainable energy, we don't forget about reducing demand because it is the most cost effective way to make this transition. Uh, but now transitioning over to supply and um, Orlando actually is fortunate that we own our own electric and water utility. Back in 1923, the city of Orlando acquired uh, a company and, and established the Orlando Utilities Commission. This is a municipal, municipal utility uh, and it is um, vertically integrated, meaning that we have generating facilities, ge electric generating facilities, transmission, distribution wires, we own the AMI metering, everything in between. And we're also one of the largest municipals in the country, the 14th largest utility in the US. Now, although we have a pretty diverse mix, as you saw there, uh, the city of Orlando in 2017 came out with a pretty bold vision, and that is that we're going to transition the city towards 100% renewables for municipal operations by 2030 and citywide by 2050. And this was the city council date uh, when that officially passed uh, through council there. What's interesting is that there's a lot of cities, over 200 cities now and counting, that have committed to the 100% renewables commitment, which is amazing. But those cities are often not in control of their utility. Even municipal utility, even cities with municipal utilities aren't always in control of what that utility can do. Uh, and I know that sounds counterintuitive, but it's true. Um, so one of the exciting things that has uh, recently happened in Orlando is the utility has become aligned with the city in terms of our climate and sustainability goals. For a long time, OUC has been at the forefront of testing uh, solar and renewables and doing a lot of good stuff dating back 15 years ago. Uh, but uh, we hadn't necessarily come out into the public with a direct alignment with where the city is going. And so OUC went through an EIRP process, the Energy Integrated Resources Plan. And that EIRP is a forecast scenario plan that looks out to the year of 2050 and looks at the load forecast and it looks at the electricity supply that's going to meet that load. And what's fascinating is that after community engagement, after working with the city, uh, OUC made a huge commitment. That is that we are committing to net zero carbon without offsets by 2050. We're committing to intermediate CO2 reduction targets, 50% in 2030, 75% in 2040 in alignment with science-based targets and that we were ending coal-fired generation um, in Orlando at the latest by 2027. This is a big move because Orlando has some of the youngest coal plants in the country. The most recent one was turned online in 1996. This plant is going to be about 30 years old by the time we turn it off. And as you know, coal plants can last 50, 60 plus years. We're going to be turning off coal 20 to 30 years before its useful life. And I think that's a huge commitment that not only are we ending coal and setting these targets, but moving forward, every single EIRP moving forward, climate and carbon and greenhouse gas emissions are going to be embedded in the economic calculus of how we make this transition. That is uh, massive and a huge win for our city. So how do we go about you know, actually getting there to the goal? That's always the next big question. Uh, and the first thing that we decided to do is work closely with Google, Project Sunroof, NREL, and GreenLink Analytics again to map out the rooftop solar potential for the city of Orlando. Every rooftop, residential, commercial, industrial, every rooftop was analyzed for its solar irradiance and its potential for rooftop solar. What we identified was there's about two gigawatts of rooftop solar potential in Orlando. And our load is about 1.2 gigawatts. So we have more potential generation than load. Now I do want to caveat that solar has a lower capacity factor. You need three to four times as much uh, capacity versus the load in order to sustain, sustainably meet that 24-7, 365. 
So um, just rooftops though, this isn't carports, this isn't you know, ground, ground mounted systems, it isn't floating, uh, this is just rooftops and, and we were surprised to see that. And so with this data, we went even down to the building level for municipal operations and mapped out every city building. Uh, and with this, we've been able to make the case for starting to add solar to rooftops. So this next slide will be a short little video showing you some of the recent installs uh, over the course of the last year during COVID. So those were some of our new fire stations that received um, some of the rooftop solar and, and where we've prioritized our rooftop arrays for the city are on critical facilities. Those that we know we're going to need power when the grid goes down and, and we're supplementing those with automatic transfer switches and starting to land some battery systems in different core uh, areas. Uh, what you're seeing also on the screen is our fleet and facilities complex. This was the first building to get rooftop solar back in 2011. It's a 420 kilowatt system and on the right you see schematics for an RFP that is hitting the streets in just a week uh, that will create a carport connecting the H building and shading vehicles below providing conduit to electric vehicle charging stations. There will be 33 chargers underneath this structure. And this will be the EV lot, because in addition to us transitioning electric uh, renewables, but we're also transitioning towards electric uh, vehicles rapidly. Now, from the community's perspective, we've also started to host what's called solar cooperatives or solar co-ops. Uh, in partnership with Solar United Neighbors, or SUN, a fantastic nonprofit organization uh, now working across the country, uh, we've worked with them to establish these group buying programs so that homeowners who are interested in going solar can actually get more affordable uh, rooftop solar arrays through economies of scale, right? Bundling 100 homeowners that want to go solar versus just yourself helps the solar company actually get more affordable and cheaper you know, panels from a price point standpoint. And, and can pass those savings on to the customer. So um, it's been fascinating. We've seen about a 15% reduction in the market rate of rooftop solar through the Orlando Solar Co-ops just by joining neighbors and going together. And not only is this happening in Florida, it started or started in Orlando, uh, but it is happening all across the state, even in the panhandles. Uh, there's about 15 megawatts of rooftop solar that has been added through co-ops alone uh, since 2016. And in Orlando, it's hundreds and hundreds of homes every, every year that are essentially adding more rooftop solar to the grid. And we anticipate every year hosting a minimum of one co-op uh, to help our residents access solar. Now, more and more, we're beginning to see residents move into multifamily and apartments and condos. And of course, they don't have a rooftop to add rooftop solar to and go through the co-op. So we've been working also with OUC to expand our utility scale solar. Uh, what you just saw there was a short little video clip of one of the first solar farm. It was the second solar farm that we installed, uh, but the first one on a coal ash landfill. So this is actually a, a capped coal ash landfill where we were putting the byproducts of coal and burying it and instead added rooftop, added that ground mounted system. I always love the irony of that, of that story. Uh, we have about 130 megawatts of, of utility scale solar and another 150 in the pipeline. And just this past uh, year during COVID, the, the uh, city and OUC brought on uh, this larger array. It's 100, uh, 108 megawatts and essentially um, is starting to, you know, has already started to power a good amount of our city. Tens of thousands of homes uh, are able to be met uh, by 100% solar through this program. And uh, as a community solar program, residents that live in that apartment, 309B, can actually get 100% of their, of their electricity consumption offset with coming from this solar farm. So we have the, the ability of getting fossil fuel power or 100% green power in Orlando. And the other application that we've been getting a lot of attention around is what we call photovoltaics or floating solar. You know, in Orlando, when you fly into our city, you realize that we're kind of an Atlantis in reverse. There is so many water bodies 
it almost looks like we're on an island or something. And those water bodies, more often than not, are man-made retention ponds. They are holes that we create, like the ones you see there, that hold storm water after these big rain events. And of course, Florida, we, we get some rain events. Uh, and, and so what we're starting to see is the ability of adding floating solar on these retention ponds. This one's here at a wastewater treatment plant. We have them now at the airport when you fly into Orlando. We have a new one installed earlier this year in the shape of the Orlando logo. And that's an autonomous tram that you see at the bottom there. So you literally are flying into the city of the future showing autonomous trams, floating solar, you know, all types of really innovative uh, technologies. And, and speaking of innovative technologies, green hydrogen is becoming the next frontier of uh, you know, our portfolio. Um, we've been testing lithium ion, vanadium redox flow batteries, and now getting into the hydrogen space. And, and thanks to a big Department of Energy grant, um, the, the OUC was able to land um, basically this project where we are taking the floating solar, we're electrolyzing water in an electrolyzer, splitting that water in hydrogen and oxygen gas. The hydrogen is being stored in those tanks. Um, and then through a fuel cell, uh, we're, we're able to take that hydrogen, fuse it with oxygen, create an electron and water vapor. And that electron goes towards truing up the lost generation from solar due to a cloud cover or rain event, right? So as a utility, uh, you know, OUC needs to uh, rely on, on the generating assets that we have. And, and one thing we need to really get our hands around is the intermittency of, of renewables. So the part of this pilot is to test as cloud cover comes over and drops 30% of this large solar farm that you saw, can we use hydrogen and a mix of hydrogen and lithium uh, ion batteries to basically true up that generation curve and make sure that the, from a utilities perspective, they don't feel the loss of load or, or generation to meet the load of the city. Um, so we're pretty excited. Shout out to Justin Kramer and Sam Choi, our uh, colleagues over at OUC who have been leading a lot of the, the details of this project and it's exciting to see it come together. So in closing, I just got a couple of last thoughts that I thought were important to share around transportation and specifically where things are going with electric vehicles. I'm sure it's not news to you, but almost just about every automaker in the world is racing towards electric vehicles. You have you know, big companies like General Motors saying by 2035, all of the cars will be electric. You have Jaguar and Volvo that came out a couple of weeks ago saying by 2025, everything will be electric on the lot. You have, you know, uh, even your Uber and Lyfts, your rideshare companies committing to 100% electric uh, for their fleet and, and their passenger fleets by 2030. So this is going to be a huge transformation this decade. And what we're trying to do in Orlando is think about the ecosystem of policies and programs that we can implement to to be ready for this growth. And, and it covers a wide range of different things from consumer rebates to our own fleet electrification, to looking at building codes, to even consumer education and more. And so just running through this quickly, um, we have about 5,500 electric vehicles on the road in Orlando. We're anticipated to see a more than doubling, close to 12,500 by 2025. So just four years from today. And um, by 2030, uh, NREL's projections are between 10 and 30% of new vehicle sales will be electric. By 2050, about 70%. Uh, and of course, you know, that's something that is coming faster than I think cities are uh, anticipating. So we've been doing a lot to transition our fleet. Like I said, we have about 3,000 vehicles and we've committed to 100% electric and alternative fuel by 2030. Alternative fuel like CNG and like hydrogen uh, being two alternative fuels that we're looking at now. Uh, you can even see a, a Orlando police motorcycle that's all electric there at the bottom. Uh, we've been using zero motorcycles for a few years now and, and even testing things like the three-wheeled Arkimoto vehicle as, as well. From a charging infrastructure, we've been working with OUC to expand a lot of public charging uh, across the city, we have about 360 or so dedicated spots for EV. Across the county, if you include the county at large, it's about 500. Uh, and, and it's making us a hot spot for the amount of chargers per capita. We're the number one in the state right now. But in addition, I've been working on a project for about 10 months to add another 100 EV chargers around the city to city parks to parking garages, to neighborhood centers, starting to equip the, the infrastructure so that we can help uh, encourage our residents uh, to, to move towards electric vehicles and ensure that they have the reliable infrastructure to support their charging needs. 
Uh, and in addition to level two chargers, which you saw there, about 100 of them around the city, we're landing the largest uh, DC fast charging hub in downtown Orlando uh, and the largest one in the state of Florida. And, you know, one of the things in Florida we got to think about is emergency evacuations, right? We have another category five hurricane that's coming at the state. And, and what, you know, what happens when we have about 50% of the state now in electric vehicles, how do we ensure that people are safely able to evacuate from these big storms? And so the state of Florida has come out with an EV roadmap to look at charging infrastructure along state highway systems and ensuring that we can have the necessary redundancy so that, you know, in the time of an emergency like that, our residents can get out of the state safely. Um, Another unique program that we've launched for EVs is electrified dealership. So OUC is providing financial incentives to sales representatives at car dealerships uh, in order to sell EVs. And the more EVs they sell, it's on a sliding scale, the more money they make per EV. Uh, and so we just launched this in January. We have now three dealerships already signed up. They're trained through a, a kind of a, a program that we've come up with. And um, they learn about the charging infrastructure, the rates, and you know how to really encourage people to get behind the EV. And each dealership, a part of the program, is required to offer free ride and drive opportunities for residents. So if somebody wants to come out to a Nissan dealer and, and test ride an EV, you know they have to have the capabilities of doing that to join this program. So it's been pretty cool and unique. Uh, and then uh, working with our transit authority, really trying to electrify our, our bus fleet. And, and, and Lynx, which is the transit authority, has committed to 100% electric and all, all fuel buses by 2030 in alignment with the city. So we're both in that alignment. But um, in downtown Orlando and around the central business district, we also have a BRT, a bus rapid transit. It's a free service offered by the city. And uh, this next little video clip is, is of the unveiling of our first EV bus. So pretty cool. The last thing I have for you all today is just sharing that the work that we're doing in Orlando um, is, is also looking to be replicated and scaled across the region. And we're fortunate that we've um, been able to create and establish what's called the Regional Resilience Collaborative or the R2C, which is made up, as you can see of this map, of eight counties in East Central Florida uh, that are working together now in order to develop a regional greenhouse gas emissions inventory, a regional climate vulnerability and risk assessment, uh, a regional green, green, blue, gray infrastructure assessment, and even thinking about equity and health and economic vitality. Uh, right now we have over 35 government partners. It's one of the largest regional climate collaboratives in the country. And we're hopeful that even some of our rural counties and cities that haven't been thinking about this have joined us. And they're realizing that, you know, if they continue to fall behind the curve, they may never be able to catch up. And they're excited about this collaboration. So, you know, the culture of collaboration and partnerships is, is so strong in Orlando. And I think it's a big reason why we're able to accelerate this, this good work. So with that, I will turn it over back to um, the team for a Q&A session. Excellent. Uh, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, that was a really comprehensive and interesting, uh, interesting presentation. Uh, we do already have quite a few questions from the audience. So uh, why don't we uh, get started with those and I'll ask my question if we have a little bit of time uh, at the end. So first we have uh, Melissa Horin, who's uh, a Lake Brantley High School and the University of Florida alumna. So uh, excellent to have hey. some, uh, some, some, some uh, local knowledge here. Yeah. Uh, so she's asking about um, uh, people running their air conditioners in Florida, you know, nine, 10 months uh, per year. And of the population that, uh, you know, uh, has a quite high kind of median age. So um, is there any effort to, uh, you know, increase awareness of energy uh, saving and energy efficiency uh, among this uh, population in Florida? And in yeah, most definitely. I mean, that's part of part of our job here in the Office of Sustainability is providing continual education to the residents, to our businesses. We're, we're constantly out there. Um, you know, each individual month we're at a different neighborhood meeting with a commissioner. Uh, and so we, we often are going out there to answer questions from our residents, help point them to different programs that either the city or OUC have. 
Uh, one of the programs that I didn't mention that, that gets to this question is called Efficiency Delivered. And it's offered by OUC and Efficiency Delivered is very unique because it provides every resident with a free home energy and water assessment at no cost. And in addition, after identifying the ECMs, what we call the energy conservation and water conservation measures, OUC will offer up to $2,500 to make improvements up to that amount. And those improvements, no out-of-pocket expense for the homeowner to get those improvements. And then based on household income, the homeowner repays for that $2,500 on the utility bill over 24 months with no interest. So they're basically using the savings of the improvement to pay for that marginal line item on the utility bill to pay back and doing that over a two year period. And so you're cash flow positive from day one. It is also income based subsidized. So for seniors and for low income residents, that $2,500 is actually subsidized by 80%. So $2,125 is covered by OUC in the city and only $375 needs to be repaid back on the bill over 24 months with no interest for the resident. That's about $15 a month that they would have to pay back, but they would be getting savings of 30 to $45 on average per month from the $2,500 improvement, right? So the idea here is to help people make these quality improvements to their property without any out-of-pocket expense, and then use the savings of those improvements to pay for the service over time. Got it. So that, that's a, a kind of a great model. Uh, one of the, the reasons why the solar rooftop industry kind of, kind of an early start in the United States was the no money down model where you got uh, it. people can uh, install without making any payment. So that sounds like a wonderful program. I wish we had something like that here where I, I live. So. And interestingly enough, Professor, uh, in Florida, that law that you speak of about solar is actually outlawed. So here in the Sunshine State, one of the reasons why we have been held back, right? We're, we're third in terms of potential solar generation, but we're like eight or ninth in terms of actual generation. And when you look at it from a policy standpoint, third party power purchase agreements, right? PPAs are a major enabler for rooftop solar and renewable energy. Well, third party PPAs are not allowed in Florida. We have a regulated monopoly electricity market. So you actually can't have a solar company you know, uh, sell the city uh, or add rooftop solar to the city with no out-of-pocket expense and sell us power as the utility. That's that's outlawed. Uh, okay. Leasing is allowed. So there is solar leasing, which is a little bit different than PPAs, but does offer the same type of no upfront cost benefit. But there, you know, leasing has a has a cost to it as well. And so people need to be fully transparent about the margins that are embedded in that lease arrangement and how much you're spending versus using PACE or SELF to finance a solar array that might actually be more cost effective. Got it, got it. That's interesting. I didn't actually know that. Uh, I, I knew that many of these kind of policies and regulations like net metering and everything have been a kind of a hot topic in many states, but I had no totally. idea. This yeah, was, PPAs. Uh, yeah, that's a big one. In, in, in Florida. Okay, great. So next we have uh, Badu uh, Badmanabhan is asking about the um, ensuring uh, for the building owners uh, who participate in the green building program with improved yep. standards for energy and water use. So how do you actually kind of enforce compliance? Tell us a bit about the process here. So there's two, there's the green building incentive program for new construction. And then there was the benchmarking policy that I talked about. I don't know which one specifically they're asking for. I think this question came around the, uh, the first one, uh, but the if you're still there, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But let's start with the green incentive program. Okay, so the green building incentive program is for new construction. And again, when a building comes to be built in, in Orlando, they would go through a process of signing an agreement with the city to say, if I build it to lead silver, gold, or platinum, if I build it to that, then you as the city are going to rebate me based on that level of certification. So it's a standard agreement. It doesn't lock you in to lead silver or lead gold. If you try to go lead gold but end up lead silver, that's totally okay. You'll just get the less incentive, right? And the idea is that you have to do that before you get your permit documents to construct the building. Then what happens is, Usually uh, 18 months to two years goes by, the building is completed, you're going through your CO, you get your CO, you pay your first year's property taxes, and then you essentially send um, uh, that first year's property tax payment receipt, 
you send the agreement that was signed and you send the copy of the lead certification certificate that you've achieved. And with those pieces of information, the city will literally issue a check for the incentive that was agreed upon, right? right? So it's very streamlined. It's it's pretty simple. It doesn't have to go to city council every single time. I mean, it's really administratively streamlined on purpose to make it easy and a no-brainer. Now, the benchmarking policy is a good question because that policy requires that buildings score themselves using Energy Star and report that information to the city. We then take that information and make it publicly available, right, through that open map. Now, if a building is under the score of a 50 out of 100, 50 is the national average for that space type, year built, building characteristic, you name it, right? So Energy Star has these very sophisticated algorithms and it knows that you're in this climate zone. It's not comparing us to the same building in the Northeast at Johns Hopkins. It's, not, it's comparing us to only buildings in our climate region, right? And so the score is applicable from a weather normalized standpoint from a building normalized standpoint. So, so now you're a one to 100 score, 50 is the national average, 100 is the best in class energy star, one is the worst building in class, right? And so anybody, any building that scores and is under 50, then gets required to do an ASHRAE level two energy audit. Now benchmark just gives you your score, right? It doesn't tell you exactly why your score is a 30 out of 100. It just says, hey, your score is a 30. So an energy audit goes further to look at the base building systems, the heating and cooling, the lighting, the plug load, the service hot water, the envelope, all of the characteristics that add to a building's energy use. And, and then that needs to be submitted to the city as well. In our current policy, there is no requirement for the building to improve its score. At this point in time, there's no requirement for the building to improve the score. All you have to do is benchmark your building and go through the energy audit once in a five-year period. If you're under 50, you have five years to do that ASHRAE level two audit. And that's all you have to do. What we have seen in studies is that more than 80% of the time, when a building owner and their CFO are given information about ways to save money and therefore increase incomes, they end up doing it especially if you have financial tools that can be offered to them to offset the upfront cost to do it in the first place, right? And so it's really about an information gap that building owners aren't managing what they measure because they're not measuring. So the part of the policy is require measurement, require that information transparency, and that creates in and of itself a cycle of improvement for buildings. Now, last thing I'll say is we are exploring ways to improve the policy. And Cities like New York, St. Louis, and DC have recently passed what they call building performance standards. Building performance standards would require that your building achieves a certain performance score by a certain year uh, in order to be in compliance. So if I'm a 30 out of 100, it might say you have to be a 50 by 2025. And then in addition to just auditing your building, you actually have to go through with retrofitting your lighting and changing the HVAC. What does that do? It creates an economy. It starts creating investment and creating jobs and you start reducing pollution and increasing net operating incomes for the building owner. I mean, the building owner is gonna, say, is gonna make more money because their expenses are lower and therefore more money is gonna go in their pockets. So it's really a win-win situation. It's just a matter of how you present the opportunity. And, and that's what we've learned here in Orlando. Got it. That's that's really interesting. And um, there has been quite a bit of research on, on different policies in the building zone. And I think performance standards are generally treated as one of the most effective ones, exactly because they kind of, first of all, they force continued improvement, right? So you have, you have to do something in the next three to five years, then you have to do again something. And then the other one is the kind of broader impact that they create a kind of an economy or ecosystem. Uh, right. So it's much easier to do it when everybody else is doing it as well. If you are the only building trying to improve, where do you find the contractors to do the work and, and all that? So Exactly, like good points. Small, Great small points, professor. Yeah. Direction. Okay, uh, next we have a question from Alana Tang, who's asking about the floating panels. So um, is there any risk that they would have some negative impact on the ecosystems below the panels? Most definitely. Uh, the number one question I had when we started to look at floating solar. So thank you for bringing that up. The impacts on aquatic life and the surrounding ecosystem, especially in Florida, when we're so, uh, when water is such a precious resource for us, is critical. Uh, so first and foremost, none of these 
floating solar arrays are on natural spring fed lakes or on natural lakes period. These are all man-made retention pond water bodies. And that's why I wanted to mention that in, in the presentation. In addition, we did receive a grant that we're currently in the process of administering uh, uh, the, Flo the Florida Solar Energy Center, FSEC, which is a research institute of the University of Central Florida, my alma mater, uh, they, they essentially are administering this research grant to look at um, a few things. One is, are there efficiency gains of floating solar versus rooftop, carport, and ground-mounted systems? Because water has higher specific heat, it helps mitigate temperature changes better than land, uh, and therefore the hotter solar panels get, the less efficient and less output they have. And, you know, interestingly enough, right? So if we can mitigate temperature rise on the actual panels, you may be able to increase the, the output, the efficiency of those panels as well. That's part of the research. The second part of the research is uh, their resilience. So during hurricanes and storms, are floating solar arrays more resilient to high speed wind events than rooftop solar or carport solar or whatever? And of course, being so low lying, uh, they, they are more resilient. We had a floating solar array in 2017 when Hurricane Irma and Maria went straight through Florida and we certainly got hit by it for sure. And that array wasn't even touched there was not even wires dangling because it's so low lying, uh, there wasn't a lot of impact at all, if any, uh, from the wind. And then lastly, we are looking at the biological impacts. Uh, and, and one of the things that we're interested in is, um, does the coverage, you know, how much can you cover a pond before it starts to have impacts? And does the coverage of the pond mitigate eutrophication, uh, i.e. algae blooms from high nutrient runoff better uh, than, than other uh, methods. And we spend a lot of money and, and resources spraying chemicals uh, that we're trying to eliminate in the city in order to control a lot of that algae growth. And we are seeing some reduction of the algae growth because the solar panels are mitigating the amount of sunlight that's hitting the water and therefore uh, blooming of the algae. Um, do, so those are a couple of things that we're looking at. We're also looking at the impacts on avian population, so birds, uh, as well as other aquatic life like fish and, and uh, aquatic plants underneath the water. Um, the UCF biology department is uh, doing that research. And so soon we, we should get more information about that. That, that, that's wonderful. Um, next, we have a question from uh, Joe uh, Omuller, who's uh, actually from our Energy Resources and Environment Program. So thanks for joining us, Joe. Uh, he's asking uh, about the, the methodology for the rooftop solar viability data. So is this uh, kind of a sum of all the rooftops in Orlando or those that are kind of in the best positions, uh, those who can afford to invest? Could you just briefly summarize the methodology? Great question. Fantastic question. So the methodology that was used in that screenshot that I provided was coming from Google's Project Sunroof. And they have uh, a bunch of information on their website about the methodology that they have gone about. It does look at the orientation, the readiness of the building, and it really primarily looks at the theoretical solar potential based on solar irradiance. Now, we also wanted to go beyond that and say, well, you know, 90, it said 92% of rooftops technically can have solar on them based on the irradiance. And I said, that's high. I don't think that 90% of our rooftops in Orlando actually can land solar. So let's go deeper. And as part of the EIRP process that I talked about with the utility, right, we hired NREL to do what's called a DGEN study, distributed generation study. DGEN study basically is broken down into three core uh, facets. The first one is a theoretical potential based on solar irradiance. That pretty much matched the Google Project Sunroof data. It said it was about, uh, it was about two gigawatts, a little over two gigawatts of potential solar that could be installed. Then we went further and said, what's the economic feasibility of the rooftop solar potential in Orlando? And what we identified was that there's about 700 megawatts out of the two gigawatts that could be installed on rooftops that are economically viable. 700 megawatts out of the two gigawatts, right? And then we went further to say, what's the adoption probability? Even though it's economically viable, based on other technologies, what's the probabilities, uh, adoption probability of people investing between now and 2050? And what it said was about 390 to 400 megawatts of the 700 potential would be installed. Uh, and so from two gigawatts of potential, 
we really are looking at around 400 megawatts of rooftop solar in Orlando that will help us to meet that future growth. Um, Excellent. So hopefully that, yeah, hopefully that answers your that that, question. That's wonderful. It's kind of like a waterfall you go. You got it. And, and exactly. Uh, some of the water. Uh, so next I have uh, Carolina um, Echeverri, uh, who's uh, a fellow Floridian, uh, and uh, she's asking a very interesting question. So um, is, the, um, is the city of Orlando or your regional collaborative trying to uh, in some way influence or advocate the state government uh, in, when it comes to sustainability uh, and uh, uh, resilience? Yes, in short, we are. Um, you know, especially this legislative session, there are some uh, preemption bills that we are very concerned about. There are some specific to energy infrastructure. There are some to spe specific to greenhouse gas uh, emission regulations that, you know, these, uh, you know, I, I will say that there has been a pretty active uh, effort to strip home rule away from local governments to control things around sustainability for some time. And uh, we have been able to mobilize a number of our cities and counties in the state of Florida through what's called the Florida Sustainability Directors Network, FSDN for short. It's a subset of USDN, which is the Urban Sustainability Directors Network across North America. It includes Canada as well as the US. Those peer networks uh, are very powerful. Uh, they, they allow us to, to unify our mayor's voices and go after federal changes in legislation as well as at our own state level. So we have a, a statewide peer network. It's about 40 or so members of cities and counties. And we have jointly done joint letters for uh, one specific one that's currently in the, in the works is what's called FICA, the Florida Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act. FICA is a public service commission requirement to the regulated utilities to have a certain goal for energy savings, right? In order to uh, mitigate, you know, the rise in, in rates uh, and, and cost on residents. Well, the last few years, FICA has been attacked by the utilities and the utilities have been coming into the public service commission asking for literally zero goals, literally their ask is eliminate goals. We don't want goals uh, for energy efficiency. And uh, back in 2015, the last time FICA was updated, they were successful in gutting about 95% of the efficiency goals that were set. And what happened was Duke Energy, FPL, Tico, a lot of the investor owns eliminated their efficiency programs. I knew hundreds of people that were fired that were in their energy audits arm and doing a bunch of stuff for efficiency. In Florida, under our regulated uh, approach, Utilities are disincentivized to save energy because the way that they can, the only way they can actually make profit is by building infrastructure. It's by adding assets to the rate base and then asking the PSC to increase rates to cover the cost of the asset. And, and so that, and they get a guaranteed rate of return. They have the best business model in the world. They get a guaranteed 10% internal rate of return for their investments. So they can build a new power plant and then they go to the PSC to ask for increasing rates to cover the cost of the power plant over the useful life. And that's how they're able to move it forward. But if I drive more energy efficiency and we create stronger building codes and policies, which erodes the need for new power plants, then they're not gonna make as much money, right? And so there's this disincentive for the utilities to actually wanna save energy. It's not that they're evil people, it's just their business model because of the state's regulatory structure isn't for that. And so you have these utilities writing letters saying zero goals, zero goals for FICA. And as cities, we're saying, what are you talking about? How do you ask for zero goals when we've committed to saving energy within our community? Even our utilities have, have committed to it, but they're asking for zero goals. What they really want is their own control. They don't want the state to require them to hit a certain goal. And they have been saying, well, we're still gonna save energy. We're still gonna have these programs, but we just don't wanna be told how much we should save. So that's really the conundrum. But to the question, yes, we, we have been pretty active. We've submitted joint letters. We've submitted individual letters, uh, not just to the state, but to federal governments, even in the last administration, to combat a lot of the erosion of environmental regulations uh, that we witnessed across the country. Got it. Perfect. Uh, th thank you. Th that's very important work. It's, it's good to have some of the kind of innovation and enthusiasm uh, trickle up to the sometimes slower state and uh, federal government. So of course, with the new administration, maybe in the future, we will also get some
top-down uh, momentum. Uh, I think we're already seeing some of it, so exactly. we're excited about exactly. that. We are also yep. a pretty good start here. So, yep. uh, Chris, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's really great to hear uh, all these updates, and uh, thanks to everybody in the audience for the for the great questions and, and discussion. Uh, again, please do check out our initiative at size-icep.org. Uh, the link is in the in the chat. And Chris, uh, let's be in touch. I hope I'll have a chance to uh, visit uh, the city beautiful uh, as soon as this pandemic is under control and we can uh, keep doing the good work. Thanks so much. Love, love to day. welcome you. Thank you much. Bye-bye. Take care.